what I come. When we see cases like this or like this, what are they? Are they vascular malformations? Are they vascular anomalies? Or are they vascular tumors? More of these confusing diagnoses. It is time to get a clarity on these. What are vascular anomalies? What are vascular malformations? And what are vascular tumors? How do we differentiate them? This time, we are going to try to understand all this with the help of case studies. The International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies Classification says that all these vascular anomalies can be classified either as vascular tumors, example hemangioma, or vascular malformations, example AV malformation. Vascular tumors were formerly classified as hemangiomas. They are true neoplasms with pathologic cell proliferation, rapid postnatal growth and slow regression into late childhood are the hallmarks of vascular tumors. These are examples of vascular tumors of the hands. On the other hand, vascular malformations are abnormally formed channels within a vascular apparatus and are lined by endothelial cells and there is no abnormal cellular turnover. They are also congenital in nature but usually not noticed at birth. They never regress and grow proportionately with the individual. Vascular malformations are classified according to the type of vessel that is involved. That is, it could be a capillary malformation, venous malformation, lymphatic malformation or arteriovenous malformations. This shows an example of a vascular malformation. So now we have seen two categories, vascular tumor and vascular malformation. Let us see what are the difference between these two types of lesions. Vascular tumors are commoner in females, in premature children and low birth weight infants, whereas vascular malformations have an equal sex ratio. Vascular tumors are often absent at birth. Vascular malformations are typically present at birth but may not be noticed. Vascular tumors typically have a postnatal proliferation for about 6 to 9 months followed by involution that may take up to 7 years. The vascular malformations have a lifelong persistence with commensurate growth with the individual. Vascular tumors are a well-defined mass with high flow vessels, whereas vascular malformations depend on the type and we shall see about that a little later in this video. Vascular tumors are GLUT1 positive, whereas vascular malformations are GLUT1 negative. GLUT1 refers to the glucose transporter protein 1 which facilitates the transfer of glucose across the plasma membranes. Vascular malformations have a typical compressibility and this is seen more when the venous component is high because here the filling up of the collapsed malformation takes some time to fill up. Elevated D-dimer levels and fibrinogen levels are seen typically in venous malformations. The plain X-ray in a venous malformation may show phlebolith formation which is small stones that occurs within the venous mass. An MRI especially with a contrast will show the mass that is formed by the venous malformation. A CT angiography will show the dilated vessels in some types of malformations, typically the AV malformations. The commonest type of vascular malformations are venous malformations and arteriovenous malformations. Both are different from each other and we shall study the difference between these two malformations using case studies. This 15 year old boy presented with a swelling on the right palm of 3 years duration 
there was occasional pain but there was no bleeding or ulceration over the swelling. Examination showed a bluish swelling on the right palm and thumb web regions. It was soft and compressible. There was no pulsatility and there were no motor or neurosensory deficits. MRI revealed a soft tissue mass in the subcutaneous area extending up to the level of the muscles. The MRI report said an irregular lobulated soft tissue hyperintense lesion was noted. And more importantly, the report mentioned that there was no significant flow void. The marking for the incisions to be made were as shown. And you can note another incision on the thumb web to remove the lesion in that area. Under supraclavicular block and tunica control, the incisions were made. The venous mass that was noticed in the subcutaneous area was excised in toto, making sure to avoid injuring the radial side digital nerve, the ulnar side digital nerve, the flexor pollicis longus along with its pulleys and the thinar muscles. This was the position on the sixth post-operative day when it was noted that the suture line was clean and healthy. Hence, mobilization was now started. Active movements were encouraged and then dressings were applied with a compression bandage and a short opponent splint. Mobilization was encouraged. This is very important to ensure good return of function because we have noted that there is no injury to either the nerves or the muscles. And this is the result at the end of one and a half months. Contrastingly, there is another patient, a 22-year-old female, who had a small swelling present from birth which increased in size since 4 years. And here too, pain was occasional. There was no history of bleeding from the swelling. The swelling was noted to be about 8 cm in diameter. It was a pulsatile swelling and a thrill was felt on palpation. A brewery could be auscultated. X-ray showed no phlebolites or erosion of the bones. MR angiography revealed communicating vessels and arterial input coming into the vascular malformation. The report said there was a mixed signal intensity lesion noticed in the left thinar muscle with mild intralesional flow voids. Hence the possibility of left thinar muscle mixed vascular malformation arteriovenous malformation or hemangioma. One month earlier, embolization had been done for this vascular malformation by the interventional radiologist who performed a superselective embolization of the arteriovenous malformation arterial feeders using glue and the glue that was used was histoacryl. Since it was a very localized lesion and embolization had already been done, we took up this patient and made the markings as shown. The surgery was performed under supraclavicular block anesthesia and tunica control. After the incision is made, the skin flaps are raised both on the radial side and on the ulnar side of the ellipse that we have marked. While raising the skin flaps, it is important to cauterize every single vessel that is feeding the malformation. Now the mass has been almost completely excised. It is quite solid thanks to the embolization that was done earlier. We can make out the intact radial side digital nerve, the ulnar side digital nerve and the flexor pollicis longus and most of the thinar muscles are intact. This was the early post-operative result at the end of one week and at the end of two months this was the result. The patient has been started on therapy for opposition exercises of the thumb to ensure return of complete function. We have now seen two types of vascular malformations, venous malformation and arteriovenous malformation. Let us study the difference between these two types of malformations, which are the commonest occurring. Venous malformations are usually bluish in color whereas arteriovenous malformations may be sometimes tinged red. Venous malformations are collapsible when superficial. 
but not very obvious when they involve the muscles. Arteriovenous malformations are not much collapsible. They are actually collapsible but they fill up so fast that they do not appear collapsible. Venous malformations typically have no pulsations, no thrill on palpation and no bruit on auscultation. Whereas arteriovenous malformation are pulsatile, they have a thrill and they have a bruit on auscultation. Venous malformations grow with the patient and more at puberty. Arteriovenous malformations have four stages of growth, quiescent period, the growing period, the symptomatic period and finally the decompensating period. Phleboliths on x-ray are characteristic of venous malformations. Arteriovenous malformations do not show phleboliths. On MRI, we get a hyper intense signal with a mass for venous malformations and typically no flow voids. Whereas in the arteriovenous malformation, we get numerous flow voids and hyper intense signal without mass. Pathologically, the venous malformation is a mass of veins and venules lined by a single endothelial layer. Whereas in the arteriovenous malformation, the typical pathology is a nidus, which is an abnormal connection between arterial and venous systems. The treatment options for both venous malformations and arteriovenous malformations are sclerotherapy, embolization and surgery. But for venous malformation, sclerotherapy and surgery are the top options whereas for arteriovenous malformations, embolization is the best method of management which can be followed up with surgical excision. We must remember that the treatment options of AV malformations can have complications. The complications can be following embolization where loss of vascularity or gangrene of the neighboring fingers or the same involved finger may also occur. Following surgery, complications may also occur during surgery which will manifest as torrential bleeding after release of the tunicae. This can be avoided by perfect hemostasis while the surgery is being done under tunicae and also by the use of spray mode diathermy or biclamp application. Hemostatic matrix application will also help. If all this does not help and bleeding is still continuing in spite of all these measures, it is advisable to pack the wound with a saline pad and close the wound over it. After three days, under anesthesia, the dressing needs to be opened and again we need to get hemostasis if it is not already achieved. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do click on the shown links to see more about other surgical procedures in hand surgery. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery, trauma surgery and ethics. Manakam.